Now the last time we had just concluded Numbers 33 and that was kind of a Cliff Notes version of the route of the Exodus that enumerated 42 stations where events of significance took place during the Israelites' wilderness journey, a journey that was but weeks from its conclusion. Now we discussed how the Lord gave Moses some tough instructions about how they were to go about invading and taking Canaan. They were to drive out all the inhabitants from every corner of the land, they were told. The only Canaanites that should be allowed to remain are those who renounce whatever tribal affiliation they had and joined Israel. This meant that they also had to completely disavow their gods and to obey the Torah. Now naturally, there weren't a whole lot to chose to do this. Those who fought against Israel and refused to let go of their land were to be killed. Now moreover, the Lord told Moses that if Israel failed to do this, not only would the people who remained in the land be a constant thorn in the side of Israel, but that the Lord would deal with Israel in the same manner that he intended on dealing with those pagans. Chapter 33 concluded with the instruction that the allotment of territory among the tribes of Israel should commence immediately and it was to be done incorporating two methods by lots and by proportionality. That is, lots were cast to determine the general region of Canaan that each tribe would receive, but the size of each tribe's territory would be proportional to that si tribe's population. Well, it's been a long road as we've been studying the book of Numbers, but the book's rapidly coming to a close with some laws about the boundaries of the territory the Lord's giving to Israel, some other laws about how the land is to be protected and, and, and governed. Starting in last week's study, chapter 33, and progressing to the end of the book of Numbers, the subject is all about the imminent possession of the land of, uh, land of Canaan, the promised land. You know, I think it's difficult for us in the 21st century to imagine and to internalize just what a momentous event the occupation of the land of Canaan by the Hebrews was. If we think of the grandest moments of the Bible, we'd probably list creation, the great flood, the parting of the Red Sea, the exodus, and the advent of Jesus Christ at the top of that list. But without doubt, the realization of this 600-year-old covenant of Abraham, that Abraham's descendants would receive a land for their own possession forever, that belongs on that list, right near the top. And just as believers wait expectantly for the return of our Messiah and the establishment of his kingdom, so did Israel await for their covenant-based land inheritance given them by the Lord. And this was because from the time of Abraham up until this point in the Torah, the Hebrews had always been a people without a country. From the moment the Lord told Abraham to get up and leave his native land, which was Mesopotamia, and to disassociate himself from his country and his family, meaning to forsake them, disavow them, Abraham and all those Hebrews who would come from his loins would be for centuries essentially nothing but resident aliens, sojourners, visitors, wherever they went. Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob, even though they wandered around in various parts of Canaan, lived there at the pleasure of the Canaanites who owned and controlled that territory. When they resided down in Egypt, it was at the pleasure of the Pharaoh. Joseph, who became the Grand Vizier of Egypt, didn't consider Egypt his home. And so he ordered that his mummified body be taken to the land, uh, land of Canaan on that marvelous day when Israel left Egypt for a journey to the land that would be their own. Believers, in addition to all of this being true and actually happening, it is also a pattern and a picture of us. 
and of our condition. The Torah with the central theme being the creation of Israel as a people and then as a nation is a pattern of what the body of believers would experience in a time future to Moses. A time when the Lord would create another covenant for the purpose of refining just who would be included and on what terms that set apart people of his. And when Abraham accepted Jehovah as his God, knowing him only at that time as El Shaddai, God of the mountain, and leaving everything else behind, Abraham was presented a covenant by and with God, a promise that was written in concrete. And by accepting the covenant, Abraham became locked into the blessings of that covenant. And when we accept Yeshua as our God and our Savior, we leave the past behind. And we accept the reality of the covenant as guaranteed by His blood. And by accepting this renewed covenant, we're locked into its many blessings. Yet, after Abraham accepted the covenant, the primary provision being a guaranteed place to live forever, that would be his own, a place where he and his descendants belonged, their permanent home, it would be a long time before that home was realized. And in the meantime, his descendants were strangers in a foreign land. As is clear from the pattern, believers, even though we are already living under the terms of the new covenant, we've not yet realized the end result. A permanent place to live. A place where we actually belong. A place set apart for us. And that place is the kingdom of God. I've been a believer almost my entire life. But it's probably only been in the past 15 years or so that I've really begun to feel the effects of what I am. A stranger living in a foreign land. And I'm going to remain in that condition until the Lord decides it's time for me to go home. I mean, truly, I've been quite comfortable in this world. I got along well with the world. I prospered in the world, even though I was spiritually set apart from the world by God due to my acceptance of His Son. Yet, the Lord has told us emphatically, we don't belong here. That in our new condition, may, we may be in the world, but He doesn't see us as of the world. Israel was in Egypt for a long, long time. But were they ever of Egypt? No. And as time wore on, they became more acutely aware, and the people of Egypt became more acutely aware, that the Israelites were round pegs trying to occupy square holes. The Egyptians became acutely aware. The Hebrews weren't part of Egypt. They were odd. They were different. They didn't fit. But for a while, they served useful purposes as slaves. Oh, the Egyptians enjoyed what these Hebrews brought to the game. But at the same time, the Egyptians, over time, grew to hate them. Even though they weren't always hated. At first, the Hebrews were welcomed. The Egyptians even learned from the Hebrews. They adopted, pardon me, some of their ways. Egypt even prospered as a result. Slowly. De decade after decade, the Hebrew separateness and their differentness, that's a word, began to irritate the Egyptians. In time, that irritation turned into bitterness. Finally, during the lifetime of Moses, that bitterness overflowed into violent hatred. And there was no choice for Israel's survival but to be taken out of Egypt and placed into the kingdom that the Lord had prepared for them. The older I get, the more I feel that. I hardly recognize my country anymore. Sometimes it's hard for me to go to sleep 
I'm one of those that thinks about things. Can't turn it off. I think about it. And I wonder what kind of a world my grandchildren now are going to face. I know what's right and what's wrong. Because the Lord has taught me. But most of the world says, oh, there's not really right and wrong. Not necessarily even good and evil. It's just a cultural choice. I know there is only one God. The God of the Bible. And his name is yud heh Because I personally know him. But the world says that if there is a God, he goes by many names. Buddha, Hindi, Allah, to name a few of them. I'm just not comfortable here anymore. I'm really not. I feel like a child who was adopted shortly after birth and one day I realized I don't look anything like my parents or my brothers and sisters. And I start to long to know who I really am. I know I don't belong here, and the people around me who don't know Yeshua, you know what? They're not very comfortable with me either. And they're questioning whether I'm really one of them. Do they want to be around me anymore? But like Abraham, I too have been placed under a covenant. I have been promised a place where things are going to finally operate the way they're supposed to. A place where the government will be upon the shoulders of our Messiah. A place where I belong. And like Israel, I've been redeemed. I don't belong to my cruel taskmaster anymore. I've begun my exodus. I have received God's word. I'm on a journey through the wilderness towards a final destination, but I'm still in a holding pattern. I'm not there yet. We today sit precisely where Moses and Israel were at this point in the book of Numbers. The promise of God's covenant to us is right there. Right there. And we can actually see it. You can even smell it. And soon, very soon, we're going to be able to take hold of it. But we're not there yet. Yet this life we're living, our time of wandering in this wilderness, is not to be idle time. It's not wasted time. Our job is to learn the ways of the Lord, to practice them, because once we're at our destination, we'll be living those ways, those ways, far more completely and eternally in the presence of Yeshua than we ever imagined. So here in Numbers, as the people of Israel can actually see for the first time their destination, it's just off in the distance a little further. It's just days, hours, maybe, before it's theirs. God gives them some instructions now about how they're to live in this land. Let's read some of those instructions in Numbers chapter 24. Open your Bible to Numbers chapter 24. Or, I'm sorry, 34. 34, Numbers chapter 34. Page 192, if you have a complete Jewish Bible. <clears throat> Adonai told Moshe to give this order to the people of Israel. When you enter the land of Canaan, it will become your land. To pass on as an inheritance, the land of Canaan is defined by these borders. Your southern portion will extend from the Zin Desert close to the border of Edom. The eastern terminus of your southern border is the end of the Dead Sea. From there, your border turns and it goes south of the uh, Akrabim uh, ascent and passes on to Zin. And from there, it goes south of Kadesh Barnea onto uh, Hatzar Adar and onto Atzmon. Then the border turns and it goes from Atzmon to the Wadi of Egypt and along to the sea. 
Your western border will be the Great Sea. Your northern border will be as follows. From the Great Sea, mark a line to Mount Hor, and from Mount Hor, mark a line to the entrance of Hamat. The border goes out to Zedad. Then the border goes to Zifron, and finally to Hatsar Anan. This is your northern border. For the eastern border, mark your line from Hatsar Anan to Shfam. Then the border goes from Shfam to Ribla on the east side of Ain, then down until it hits the slopes east of Lake Kinneret. From there it goes down the Yarden, the Jordan River, until it flows into the Dead Sea. These will be the borders of your land. Moses gave this order to the people of Israel. This is the land in which you will receive inheritances by lot, which Adonai has ordered to give to the nine tribes and the half-tribe. The tribe of the descendants of Reuben have already received their land for inheritance according to their clans, and so have the descendants of Gad and of the half-tribe of Manasseh. These two and one-half tribes have received their inheritance on this side of the Jordan, across from Jericho and eastward towards the sunrise. And Adonai said to Moses, These are the names of the men who will take possession of the land for you. Eleazar the Kohen, the priest, and Yahashua, Joshua, the son of Nun. Also appoint one leader from each tribe to take possession of the land. The names of these men are from the tribe of Judah, Kalev, the son of Yephunneh. From the tribe of the descendants of Shimon, Shmuel, the son of Amhud. From the tribe of Binyamin, Elidad, the son of Kislom. From the tribe of the, of the descendants of Dan, a leader, Buki, the son of Yogli. And from the tri descendants of Yosef. From the tribes of the descendants of Manasseh, a leader, Haniel, the son of Ephod. From the tribe of the descendants of Ephraim, a leader, Kemuel, the son of Shiftan. From the tribe of the descendants of Zebulun, a leader, Elitzphan, the son of Parnak. From the tribe of the descendants of Issachar, a leader, Paltiel, the son of Azan. From the tribe of the descendants of Asher, a leader, Achahud, the son of Shlomi. And from the tribe of the descendants of Naphtali, a leader, Pedahel, the son of Amahud. These are the ones whom Adonai ordered to divide the inheritance among the people of Israel and the land of Canaan. Now the 12 verses, these first 12 verses, are simply the boundaries of the promised land. Many of the points given are not even known today, but some of them are. Certainly the easternmost part of the, um, the, the Jordan River um, right up through here, Jordan River would be like this. Those are easy to identify. Even the northern part is fairly certain, but the south, southern boundary, not so much so. Now look at this map because it's a lot easier to understand these boundaries, looking at this map. Now there are Egyptian records from approximately this same period, 14th century BC, that are virtually identical in describing the boundaries of the land of Canaan as we just read here in, your, here in Numbers, which means we know these are correct. In other words, what the Lord describes here in Numbers 34 was the generally recognized territorial boundaries of the land of Canaan in those days leading up to when Israel occupied the land. God did not redefine the boundaries of Canaan. He didn't add to them, and he didn't subtract from them. But as for the southern boundary, identified in verse 5 as the Nala Mishraim, often translated in semi-English as the Wadi of Egypt, this is probably the greatest of the controversies. And by the way, I don't buy for a minute that this southern boundary is the Nile River, which is often said. That's just not true. First, nowhere do we find the term Nala Mishraim ever used to denote the Nile. Second, the term Nala more means watercourse. It doesn't necessarily mean a desert wadi that is a dry riverbed except when a thunderstorm fills it because it can also refer to a brook 
or, or, or a small water course that is sometimes just a trickle, seasonally a stream, occasionally a torrent, that in no way is a term used to describe the Mississippi-sized Nile River. Third, as these Egyptian records are so explicit, nearly identical to the record here in Numbers about the boundaries of Canaan, if one took the Nala Mishraim to mean the Nile, that would assert that Canaan at one time included the entire Sinai Peninsula extended well onto the African continent, taking much of the land that's always been ascribed to Egypt. Fourth, as these Egyptian records are from about the same period as the Exodus. Had Canaan included the Sinai Peninsula, or even the eastern bank of the Nile, then that means that the Sinai Peninsula would have been part of the Promised Land. So it would have been a pretty short journey, like two days. I mean, out of Egypt, right into Canaan, and the journey was over. Some Exodus. So, you can see how none of that makes much sense. Now, there are more serious and reasonable disagreements over exactly where that Nala Mishraim is, but it could not have extended into the Sinai, which has always been known as Egyptian territory. Now, the next thing that can get people confused when we're discussing the boundaries of the Promised Land is when one looks at this in numbers and then goes on and looks at it in Ezekiel, the Ezekiel 47 land division is different than what we read here in Numbers, but nowhere as extremely different has been taught and that I at one time believed it was. Let's turn to Ezekiel. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 47, and we're going to look at verses uh, 13 through 23 and then move in to 48 and read 1 through uh, what? 14. Uh, yeah, 1 through 14. So we're going to read essentially from Ezekiel 47, 13 all the way through 48, 14. It's not that long. Again, we're in the book of Ezekiel, page 704, if you have a complete Jewish Bible. Adonai Elohim says this. These are the borders of the land you are to distribute for inheritance by the 12 tribes of Israel when Joseph with Joseph receiving two portions. For inheritance, you will each have equal shares. I swore to your ancestors that I would give them this land, and now it falls to you to inherit it. The borders of the land will be as follows. On the north, from the great sea through Hetlon to the entrance to Zedad, Hamat, Berta, Sibraim, which is between the border of Damascus and the border of Hamat, Hatzer Hatkon, which is the uh, towards the border of Havron. And the border from the sea will be Hatzar Ainan at the border of da uh, Damascus, while on the north, northward, is the border of Hamath. This is the north side. On the east side, measure between Havron and Damascus, Gilead and the land of Israel by the Jordan from the border to the eastern sea. This is the east side. On the side of the Negev, towards the south, it will be from Tamar as far as the waters of Mivrot Kadesh, then to the Wadi of Egypt, and then on to the Great Sea. This is the south side, towards the Negev. The west side will be the Great Sea, as far as across from the entrance to Hamat. This is the west side. This is the territory you are to divide among the tribes of Israel. You are to divide it by lot as an inheritance both to you and to the foreigners living among you who give birth to children living among you. For they are to be no different from the native born among the people of Israel. They are to have an inheritance with you among the tribes of Israel. You are to give the foreigner an inheritance in the territory of the tribe with whom he's living, says Adonai Elohim. And now chapter 48. Following is the list of tribes. This is Dan's territory. From the north end through Hetlon to the entrance to Hamat, Hazar, Ainan at the border of Damascus, northward next to Hamat, and they will have their sides east and west. Asher's territory will run alongside the territory of Dan from east to west. Naphtali's territory will run along the territory of Asher from east to west. 
Manasseh's territory will run alongside the territory of Naphtali from east to west. Ephraim's territory will run alongside the territory of Manasseh from east to west. Reuben's territory will run alongside the territory of Ephraim east to west. Yehuda's, Judah's territory will run alongside the territory of Reuben from east to west. Alongside the territory of Judah from east to west will be the offering you are to set aside. 25,000 cubits wide and an equal and length equal to the distance between the east and the west boundaries of one of the portions with the sanctuary inside it. The offering you are to set aside for Adonai is to be eight miles long and three wide. This holy offering will be for the Kohanim, the priests. It will be eight miles in length along its north and south sides and three in width along its east and west sides. Uh, Adonai sanctuary will be inside of it. The portion set aside as holy will be for the priests who are descendants of Zadok that have remained faithful to my commission and did not go astray when the people of Israel and the Levites went astray. It is to be an especially holy portion set apart for them and taken from the offering of the land next to the border of the Levites. Alongside the territory for the priests, the Levites are to have a portion eight miles long and three wide. Its total length will be eight and its width three. They may not sell, exchange, or alienate any of this choice land because it is holy for Adonai. Okay. If you look at this map, you'll see that the territorial allotment is a little different. It's somewhat bigger. Here, the Levites are given territory. They're not given any in the numbers allotment. And these territories are stacked like a totem pole with the boundary lines essentially starting at the west on the Mediterranean and extending a bit farther east, especially in the north. So what gives here? I mean, we discussed in some earlier lessons about how there are some interesting transformations at a certain point in Ezekiel, not the least of which is the reinstitution of sacrificial worship at a rebuilt temple. But also there's a change in the ritual procedures that seem to reduce the role and the importance of the priesthood to one of the to one of being almost like religious MCs over commemorative rather than effectual uh, ceremonies. In other words, just as we celebrate Passover or Resurrection Day, or maybe even communion. These observances are not a kind of ritual that affects some sort of ordained response from God. We don't have our sins forgiven as a result of doing these ceremonies. We don't find ourselves in better standing with God for doing them. We aren't purified from them. These rather standard Christian and Messianic Jewish ceremonies are simply joyful commemorations of gratitude to our Lord in remembrance of these various great things he's done in, in the past. So it's going to be in Ezekiel, but at a time when even more works of the Messiah will have been accomplished. It's my position that the reason for the differences between these visions we read of in Ezekiel versus what we have read in the Torah is that Ezekiel is speaking of the millennial kingdom period, also called the thousand year reign of Messiah Yeshua, Jesus Christ, that immediately follows the Armageddon event. As he will be literally and physically dwelling in and ruling from Jerusalem. And for a period of time, evil and rebellion won't exist on planet Earth. Therefore, there's going to be much that's necessarily different. For one thing, the number of believers 
that's going to be clamoring to live in and around Jesus the King, even though we won't be able to choose to live. I mean, we will be able to choose anywhere we want to live on this planet, apparently. It's going to be far larger than the territorial allotment of numbers would ever be able to accommodate. I can tell you that when that day comes, I plan on living over there. What about you? So we see this enormous amount of land being set aside for this purpose in the book of Ezekiel. However, the main thing that happens in Ezekiel, in this description of the kingdom land, as opposed to the Moses description we see in Numbers, is that the land on the east side of the Jordan River, more or less the land that Moses permitted Reuben and Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh to settle in, that becomes included. In any case, one negative to all this is that Israel in its entire history has never controlled or even inhabited all the territory that God gave to them in numbers, let alone what's described in Ezekiel. But it's key to grasp that whether they ever occupied it or, or not, the Lord has still reserved it exclusively for Israel. Now, what else is so interesting and relevant to us, I think, in our day, is that the promised land boundaries of Numbers 34 include virtually all of present-day Syria and also of present-day Lebanon. Is it any wonder that Syria and Lebanon are in constant war with Israel? The government of the reborn nation of Israel has never laid claim to Syria or Lebanon, but all parties on both sides, they're well aware of what the Torah says about it. They know. Muslims know, and in fact, better than most Christians, I think, and most Jews even, what the Torah says about who owns this land. Which is why they want to fight to the death over it. They just don't seem to get it, that they're just Satan's proxies. More important, though, is that both Yehovah and Satan know the score. The people of Syria and the people of Lebanon are living on land promised to Abraham and to his Israelite descendants. The fact that earthly governments and institutions, even the church, might deny this, <laughs> that didn't mean anything in heaven. Yet it also cannot be denied that the land, as described to Moses, then later on to Ezekiel, is a little different than what it was described to Abraham. Look at this map. The thing to understand about what was given to Abraham is that it is far more general in nature than what was given to Moses. Plus, since tribes moved over time and nations rose up and empires came and went, boundaries changed. And people groups grew or they shrank or some of them just disappeared. There was much change in place names in tribal locations by the time of Moses and then later on still until Ezekiel. Well, beginning in verse 13, we get a summation of some facts. For instance, the promised land is to be divided among 10 tribes, not 12, as was originally set down. Actually, it was nine tribes plus half of the tribe of Manasseh who were to get portions of it. The reason, of course, is the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and half of the tribe of Manasseh chose to stay outside of the promised land, so they gave up rights to living in Canaan. The chapter conclu concludes with a long listing of the tribes of Israel and who at the moment in history was the prince, the chieftain of each of these tribes. Therefore, these ten men, they would be given the territorial allotment for the tribe they controlled. Then it was up to them to subdivide that territory among the various clans and families that made up their tribe. 
Let's move on to chapter 35. Numbers chapter 35. <clears throat> that would be page 193 if you have a complete Jewish Bible. In the plains of Moab by the Yarden, the Jordan, across from Jericho, Adonai said to Moses, Order the people of Israel to give the Levites cities to live in from the heritage they will possess. You are also to give the Levites some of the open land surrounding the cities. They are to have the cities to live in, while their open land will be for their livestock and for growing crops and for all their animals. The open land around the cities you give the Levites is to commence at a line drawn around the city wall 1,500 feet outside of it and is to extend outward from there. Measure 3,000 feet outward from the city wall to the east, south, west, and north with the city in the center. The space between the 1,500 foot line and the 3,000 foot line will be their open land around the cities. The cities you give to the Levites are to be the six cities of refuge to which you permit the person who kills someone to flee to, plus an additional 42 cities. Thus you will give the Levites 48 cities with their surrounding open land. As to the cities you will give from those people, from the, those the people of Israel uh, possess, from the many you will take many, and from the few you will take few. Each tribe will contribute from its cities to the Levites in accordance with the size of its inheritance. Adonai said to Moshe, tell the people of Israel, when you cross the Jordan into the land of Canaan, you are to designate for yourselves cities that will be cities of refuge for you, to which anyone who kills someone by mistake can flee. These cities are to be a refuge for you from the dead person's next of kin, who might otherwise avenge his kinsman's death by slaying the killer prior to his standing trial before the community. In regard to the cities you are to give, there are to be six cities of refuge for you. You are to give three cities east of the Jordan and three cities in the land of Canaan. They will be cities of refuge. These six cities will serve as a refuge for the people of Israel as well as for the foreigner and the resident alien with them, so that anyone who kills someone by mistake can flee there. However, if he hits him with an iron implement and thus causes his death, he's a murderer. A murderer must be put to death. Or if he hits him with a stone in his hand big enough to kill someone and he dies, he's a murderer. A murderer must be put to death. Or if he hits him with a wood utensil in his hand capable of killing someone and he dies, he's a murderer. And a murderer must be put to death. The next of kin avenger is to put the murderer to death himself. Upon meeting him, he's to put him to death. Likewise, if he shoves him out of hatred or intentionally throws something at him causing his, his death, or out of hostility strikes him with his hand so that he dies. Then the one who struck him must be put to death. He's a murderer. And the next of kin avenger is to put the murderer to death upon meeting him. But suppose he shoves him suddenly but without hostility, or he throws something at him unintentionally, or without seeing him being his enemy or seeking to harm him, he throws a stone big enough to cause his death, and the person dies. Then the community is to judge between the one who struck him and the next of kin avenger in accordance with these rules. And the community is to save the killer from the next of kin avenger. The community is to return him to the city of refuge to which he fled. He's to live there until the high priest who was anointed with the holy oil dies. But even if the killer ever goes beyond the limits of the city refuge he fled to and the next of kin avenger finds him outside the limits of his city of refuge and the avenger kills the killer, he's not guilty of that man's blood. Because he must stay in his city of refuge until the death of the high priest. But after the death of the Kohen Haggadol high priest, the killer may return to the land he owns. These shall constitute your standard for judgment throughout all of your generations, wherever you live. If anyone kills someone, the murderer is to be put to death upon the testimony of witnesses. But the testimony of only one witness will not suffice to cause a person to be put to death. Also, you are not to accept a ransom in lieu of the life of a murderer condemned to death. Rather, he must be put to death. 
Likewise, you are not to accept for someone who has fled to a city of refuge a ransom that would allow him to return to his land before the death of the priest. In this way, you will not defile the land in which you are living, for blood defiles the land. And in this land, no atonement can be made for the blood shed in it, except for the blood of him who shed it. No, you are not to defile the land in which you live and in which I live. For I, Adonai, live among the people of Israel. Here's a reminder. Well, hey, back up. It is here that the matter of living accommodations for the tribe of Levi is finally taken up, beginning with a reminder that Moses was allotting the land and that Israel was on the eastern edge of the Jordan River in the former land of Moab when this land allotment took place. In verse 2, we see that as there were to be 48 cities set apart for the Levites, each tribe was to decide which cities they would give to the Levites as a permanent holding. In addition to the city proper, there was to be an amount of land contiguous to each city to be used as pasture land for the Levites' animals, but also they could grow crops. Now, let's not be naive about what the Levites were given. These were not walled. They weren't substantial cities. And they were, generally speaking, not cities that the Israelites, that, that Israelites were going to build from scratch. These 48 cities would be from among the hundreds, if not thousands, of small villages and towns that the Israelite army would capture from the various Israelite tribes during the conquest. Most, most of these cities... They were just going to consist of a handful of buildings. Let's also understand that like the Jubilee year, an essential part of the laws concerning the prohibition against permanently transferring land to other than the original owner. A celebration that the records indicated never happened even one time. The Levites also never got their 48 cities. Oh, they were assigned the cities but it was critical to the ability of those Levites to inhabit those cities that each tribe would consistently care for those Levites who were to live in those assigned cities and their territory. And in many cases, it simply didn't happen. The book of Joshua speaks about several of these Levite cities by name, but only the bigger ones. I have no doubt that some tribes chose to give the Levites unlivable and burnt out villages to inhabit. They just weren't of any value to them. So the Levites just never moved in. Instead, they concentrated themselves in the more substantial cities they'd been given, especially if one might have had walls. After all, like all other Israelites, they had to protect themselves from these bands of marauders and bandits and occasionally armies of kings that wanted to expand their own territory. The foreign tribes made no distinction between Israel and the Levites and the priests. They are all fair game. Now, verse 6 begins to speak of the famous cities of refuge. We're told there's to be six of them. Three of them on the east side of the Jordan for the two and a half tribes over there. Three on the west side of the Jordan for the nine and a half tribes over there. And we're told that just as part of the formula for deciding the um, territory each tribe would receive was based on that tribe's relative size, so it would be the size of the cities given to the Levites would be based on the amount of territory each tribe received. If a larger tribe had a larger amount of territory, then the cities given to the Levites were to be larger. So. Since that was the case, a rather ingenious method of deciding how much pasture land would go to each of the 48 cities was ordained. It was that the longitudinal measurement of a thousand cubits, about 500 yards, was to be in addition 
to the length of the town itself. So the bigger the town, the more was added to the thousand cubits of pasture land that was afforded each of the Levites uh, cities. Now, the six cities of refuge, there were, these were six of the 48, not in addition to the 48, they were central to God's justice system. Even more, the laws concerning them dealt with this foundational theological principle. God is so holy that he cannot possibly be present on land that has been defiled by murder. When we think back to Leviticus, we see how key blood is to all of God's laws. Yet, we are also shown that while blood is the only efficacious means of expiating sins, that is, only blood can bring atonement, the improper spilling of blood is an abomination to the Lord. And it defiles. One of the clearest examples of this is the matter of menstrual blood, which is a defiling thing for which there must be a purification. Yet the blood of a properly sacrificed animal could atone for all but a few of the most egregious sins, those sins the Bible calls high-handed or intentional. Here, the issue is the killing of a human being. And whether or not this killing is murder or manslaughter. So, these verses define what murder is, as opposed to what manslaughter is, and what the roles, whether what the role the city of refuge play in all this. Next week, we're going to examine this, and we're going to examine closely the role of the blood avenger. And this next week, we will finish our study of the book of Numbers. So, two weeks from now, we begin Deuteronomy. Please rise. Thank you.